Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. So today we're going to be discussing high altitude physiology. This is the first part, and this is the 27th uh, presentation in a series of 30. And we want to, of course, uh, approach this with the enthusiasm of a kid in a candy shop. So the eternal question in pediatric pulmonology, why do families of children with lung disease always want a vacation in the mountains? I mean, think about it in your practice, at least it's common in mine. So the pulmonologist's ideal vacation, the beach, a cruise, Death Valley, which is actually below sea level and therefore has slightly higher oxygen. Today, we may not answer that question, but we will talk about some of the hazards about going to altitude. And over the course of this uh, series, we'll also discuss uh, the problems of children and the problems of people with pre-existing lung disease at high altitude. So today we're going to start at the top of the world. We're then going to discuss some hazards of high altitude and then start to talk about pulmonary acclimatization to high altitude, specifically to hypoxia, which of course is the main issue at altitude. Most physiologic studies measure altitude in meters. So unfortunately, you're going to see most of the uh, studies that we talk about are talking about um, altitude in meters. But most US residents, obviously, are familiar with altitude measured in feet. So to convert meters to feet, one meter equals 3.28084 feet, or approximately 3.3. So to approximate altitude in feet, just multiply meters by 3.3. So let's start on top of the world. So the top of the world is, in fact, Mount Everest, which is 28,000. 31.7 feet, this is recently uh, determined um, to this degree of accuracy by satellites, or 8,848.9 meters. Evangelista Torricelli, 1608 to 1647, is the one that we can credit with partly with our understanding of this. He said, we live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of the element air, which by unquestioned experiments is known to have weight. He also predicted that the weight of a column of air at high altitude would be less than at sea level. And in fact, he measured barometric pressure at high altitude, and it was in fact lower than at sea level as he predicted. So this is the problem with altitude, is that we have decreased barometric pressure. So the sum of Mount Everest, 8,848.9 meters, or 28,000 feet, barometric pressure is only 253 torr. It's 760 torr at sea level. And the measured partial pressure of inspired oxygen is 43 torr. It's 150 torr at sea level. Can you survive at this altitude with this degree of hypoxia? So work done by John West and others have measured maximum oxygen consumption at various elevations, in this case plotted against total barometric pressure, so the sea level is here. And you can see that as you increase in altitude, the maximum O2 consumption that you can achieve decreases. And in fact, at the top of Mount Everest, the basal oxygen um, uptake is about the same as the maximum O2 consumption that you could achieve. An interesting coincidence that the maximum O2 consumption that one can achieve or basically to live coincides with that that you would have at the top of Mount Everest. On the summit of Mount Everest, can you survive? What is the P alveolar O2? So let's assume for a moment that P alveolar CO2 is 40 torr, which is normal. So by the alveolar air equation, the partial pressure of alveolar O2 would be barometric pressure times FiO2, which remember is always 21%, minus PCO2 divided by R. And remember, PCO2 uh, divided by R basically tells you how much oxygen is consumed. So it says this equation would predict that the alveolar PO2 would be minus 7 torr. This obviously is impossible. You need to increase the oxygen there, and you can do that by hyperventilating. So to survive on the summit of Mount Everest, you need to hyperventilate. So recall that the uh, alveolus is composed of nitrogen, oxygen, and CO2. The nitrogen inspired is neither excreted nor absorbed, so you basically exhale the same amount of nitrogen. So if you CO2, you increase oxygen. 
So this is a strategy. So this is Christopher Pizzo, who actually measured alveolar gas samples atop Mount Everest in, on October 24th, 1981. So the measured P alveolar CO2 on the top of Mount Everest was 7.5 torr, not 40, 7.5. So what is the P alveolar O2? So if we now use the alveolar air equation again, but now put in 7.5 as the CO2, um, you get an alveolar PO2 of about 35 torr. And in fact, this is what was measured in Christopher Pizzo on the summit of Mount Everest in 1984. This was part of the American Medical Research Expedition to Everest. And you can see that they basically had uh, a number of base camps here, laboratories, uh, one here, but they did were in fact able to uh, obtain some measurements from this one scientist who also was a mountain climber who in fact successfully summited um, Mount Everest. So a lot of the data we're going to talk about comes from this expedition. So it turns out PCO2 uh, does vary uh, with barometric pressure. So here, note, we're already starting with a barometric pressure of 350, which is less than half of what we have at sea level. But as you ascend in elevation or decrease uh, barometric pressure, you can see that in normal individuals, PCO2 falls. So normal individuals are hyperventilating to compensate or attempt to compensate for the hypoxia. Uh, this is a similar graph, um, actually, in this case, determined by Ron and Otis, two classical pioneers of respiratory physiology in 1948. Uh, and these are data from the uh, American Medical Research Expedition on Everest. So recall that PCO2 is inverse and proportional to ventilation. So the normal situation is an individual at rest, 70 kilogram man, according to textbooks, breathes about five liters per minute and has a PCO2 of 40. If you decrease ventilation, PCO2 rises exponentially. If you increase ventilation, CPCO2 decreases. So this is what we're dealing with here. And if you've got a PCO2 of seven, you're way out here uh, beyond this graph, actually. P alveolar CO2 is inversely proportional to alveolar ventilation. Measured P alveolar CO2 is 7.5 uh, with a PCO2 of 40. Minute ventilation measured um, with a mask and so on is about seven to eight liters per minute for a 70 kilogram man at rest. So for a PCO2 of 7.5, minute ventilation is gonna be around 40 liters per minute. So you're basically increasing ventilation seven to eight times. So at an altitude of 8,800 meters or 28,000 feet, barometric pressure is only 253, measured PIO2, Pressure, pressure inspired oxygen 43, measured alveolar PCO2 7.5, measured alveolar O2 35, and the calculated arterial O2 is about 28, and calculated venous O2 is about 21. So if we look at the oxyhemoglobin association curve for a PO2 of 28, if PCO2 is 40, O2 saturation is only about 54%. As you're sitting here listening to this lecture, this is less than the saturation of hemoglobin in, in your systemic veins returning to the lungs. That's about 75%. And of course, at sea level, uh, arterial CO2 normally is, uh, arterial saturation normally is about 100%. So remember that we have now hypocapnia, all right? Calculated PaO228 and um, mixed venous PO2 of about 21. You're alkalotic, so pH 7.76, and you're cold. Air temperature uh, is minus 18. All of these cause a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin association curve, increasing hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. So it's estimated that on the surface of, or on the summit of Mount Everest, with these values, your O2 saturation actually increases from this 54 value to about 72%. And this obviously is much better than uh, only half of your hemoglobin being saturated. So measured hemoglobin uh, was about 18. The P50 at a pH of 7.4 was 29. Measured base excess minus 7.2 millicloves per liter. 
The assumed uh, O2 consumption was about 300 mLs per minute at rest. Assumed R value was 0.87. Calculated pH then was 7.76, and the calculated O2 saturation was about 72%. So the issue here is that one adaptation to high altitude hyperventilation, in fact, improves oxygen delivery to your tissues by improving oxygen saturation even at the same very low VO2. Now, oxygen transport from the alveolus to the pulmonary capillary can be diffusion limited or perfusion limited. And the two uh, are shown here, perfusion limited gas exchange, which is what occurs at sea level. You get equilibration of blood CO2 and alveolar CO2 very quickly, all right? Because there's essentially no impediment to diffusion at the alveolar capillary membrane. In diffusion limited uh, oxygen transport, however, the alveolar capillary membrane is the main impediment to diffusion or to gas transport. So you get a slow equilibrium and the blood O2 never equals the alveolar O2. Perfusion limited gas exchange, again, characterized by complete equilibration between the alveolar and pulmonary capillary PO2. Gas transport is limited by perfusion, that is the amount of hemoglobin uh, available to receive oxygen. And um, O2 gas transport is perfusion limited at sea levels, we discussed. And this is what we see in normal individuals at sea level. Diffusion limited gas exchange, however, is characterized by incomplete equilibration between alveolar and pulmonary capillary PO2. So the rate of gas diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane is what limits its transport. Now, O2 gas transport is diffusion limited at extreme altitude. So we have curves that look something like this. So at sea level, gas transport, oxygen transport is perfusion limited because basically there's no impediment and the only thing that limits the amount of diffusion, because as you can see, oxygen rapidly um, diffuses and equilibrates, is the amount of hemoglobin available to take on oxygen. At the summit of Mount Everest, however, the diffusion gradient is so small, all right? So note that the alveolar PO2 is gonna be around 35 here. The um, mix venous PO2 is about 21, all right? So as opposed to the normal, the diffusion gradient for oxygen of around 40, 60, sorry, 60 torr in normal individuals at sea level, it's only about maybe 16 um, at the summit of Mount Everest. So basically diffusion occurs much, or oxygen transport occurs much slower. And so in normal lungs, O2 gas transport is perfusion limited at sea level. And the summit of Mount Everest, however, diffusion gradient is so low that O2 gas transport is diffusion limited. So increasing al altitude decreases the diffusion gradient, which acts like the alveolar capillary membrane is the barrier to oxygen transport. So oxygen transport becomes more diffusion limited as one increases altitude, at least at extreme altitude. So this just kind of summarizes here sea level, Barometric pressure is 760 versus 253 at the mount, summit of Mount Everest. Inspired oxygen, 150 compared to 43. Um, alveolar oxygen, 100 compared to 35. Arterial PO2, excuse me, about 98, 28. So again, there's a much more of a gradient here between the alveolus and arterial PO2. PCO2, 40, 7.5. pH, 7.4, 7.6 and O2 saturation 100 at sea level, and about 72% on the summit of Mount Everest, but this is because of hyperventilation, allowing for more oxygen in the alveolus. So subsequent to the American Medical um, Research Expedition to Mount Everest, um, a group of investigators actually measured blood gases, um, not quite at the summit of Mount Everest, but at about 8,400 meters. So just a little bit down from the summit at, uh, at a base camp here. Here's what they found, all right? And what we have is uh, measures at 75 meters, which is essentially sea level, then 5,300, 6,400, 7,200, and 8,400 meters, okay? So the partial pressure of oxygen obviously decreased. Um, and you can see here was quite low um, as predicted by the uh, 
American Medical Research Expedition Everest at uh, near the top of Everest. Arterial oxygen saturation is shown here and also decreased. And in their case, it was a little bit lower than what West found. Hemoglobin concentration uh, increased with more time at altitude. And so arterial oxygen content, that is factoring in how much hemoglobin there was, plus um, the, the saturation, as you can see, actually was relatively protected. So this did not decrease nearly as much as arterial PO2 or arterial saturation. You can see here, um, there was some decrease obviously, but it wasn't clearly as bad. So again, the adaptation of hyperventilation largely um, preserves oxygen content. So these were their arterial blood gas measurements at 8,400 meters. Um, so pH was 7.5, PO2 24, PCO2 13, not quite as low as uh, Christopher Pizzo, uh, bicarb 10, base excess minus 7 essentially, and lactate 2.2. Saturation was 54%, hemoglobin was 19, respiratory quotient uh, measured was 0.7, P alveolar O2 was 30, P arterial O2 24, and the arterial oxygen, um, alveolar 2 arterial oxygen gradient was 5.4, a little higher than what we would see in normal individuals at sea level. Basically, P arterial O2 falls as expected with barometric pressure. But O2 saturation is higher than expected due to the decreased PCO2 and the left shift of the oxygen globe dissociation curve. Increased saturation and increased hemoglobin maintain arterial oxygen content until about 7,100 meters. And the differences was with between um, Grocott's study and uh, John West study are probably due to a more brisk hypoxic ventilatory response in Chris Pizzo. So here are the comparison of the data. So a slightly lower elevation here. So the barometric pressure a little bit higher. PiO2 again a little bit higher. PiOvelar O2 was actually not higher in this case, largely because there wasn't as much hyperventilation. Arterial O2 again was a little bit lower, um, not quite as much hyperventilation. So the saturation here was actually lower than uh, Chris Pizzo, who had a brisker uh, hypoxic ventilatory response and consequently a lower PCO2. So how does performing physical work at high altitude alter ventilation? At sea level, maximal exercise is limited by the inability to deliver more oxygen to exercising muscle. So this is due to cardiovascular limitation. What is the effect of high altitude? So basically what we can see here is PO2, uh, measured here in a variety of situations, um, at um, essentially the summit of Mount Everest, okay? And here we have um, increasing exercise, okay? So this is increasing O2 uptake. So you can see that with increasing exercise, alveolar PO2 actually increases some. This is because PCO2 goes down. Arterial saturation, however, decreases. Uh, arterial PO2 decreases. And mixed venous PO2 decreases even more, uh, signifying increased O2 extraction from exercise uh, so that the uh, P mixed venous PO2 is considerably lower. That is, the increased cardiac output can't keep up. So saturation is measured on this axis, so I apologize. Um, so you can see it decreases from just about 60, not quite, um, down to about 40% uh, percent saturation uh, if one tries to exercise um, fairly maximally at, uh, well not maximum, tries to exercise vigorously at the summit of Mount Everest. Another study, this is in this case arterial O2 saturation at sea level, really no difference despite pretty significant exercise, but at uh, differing um, degrees of elevation here, in this case 6,300 meters, so that's going to be around 20,000 feet, breathing room air and then being made hypoxic at this elevation uh, to simulate an even higher elevation will decrease uh, oxygen saturation further, even with only modest levels of exercise. So oxygenation falls with increasing exercise. Thus, tissue delivery of oxygen to exercising muscle is limited 
by oxygen transfer to the circulation. So what is the contribution of cardiac limitation? Maximal oxygen consumption on non nervous is just able to sustain the basal metabolic rate. We showed you this uh, before, this maximal O2 consumption um, at uh, inspired PO2 or PIO2. And so remember, at Mount Everest, you're about here. And you can see that maximum O2 consumption uh, really just meets your basal oxygen consumption. Again, a fascinating coincidence that the highest elevation on Earth um, coincides with the highest elevation that theoretically a man can uh, exist. So the summit of Mount Everest Man adapts to extreme altitude by increasing ventilation over five times. This hyperventilation increases alveolar PO2. Hypocapnia, alkalosis, and cold temperature increase oxygen affinity for hemoglobin, and but oxygen gas transport is diffusion limited. What are the hazards of altitude? So obviously, the main hazard of um, high altitude is hypoxia. And here you can see um, in um, elevation from zero up to nearly the summit of Mount Everest. If you were at sea level, the equivalent PO2 would be breathing 8% as opposed to 21% oxygen. Um, these are uh, these elevations have been categorized low altitude uh, up to about 1500 meters or almost 5000 feet moderate up to 8,000 feet, high up to 11 to 12,000 feet, very high up to 15,000 feet, extreme to 20,000 feet, and the so-called death zone above, I'm sorry, 26,000, death zone above 26,000 feet. Barometric pressure obviously decreases. But there are other environmental changes as well. The temperature is lower, and we'll talk about that in just one second. Solar radiation is higher, and humidity is considerably lower. So this shows barometric pressure plotted here versus altitude up to 30,000 feet. So Mount Everest would be right about there. Remember that the fraction of inspired oxygen is always 21%, no matter what your altitude is. But it's 21% of a decreasing barometric pressure. So that's shown here. We can actually estimate the P inspired oxygen tension or partial pressure of inspired oxygen, PiO2, by the rule of fives. That is, PiO2 decreases by five torr for every thousand feet that you ascend in altitude. If you are at 5,000 feet, for example, normal PiO2 at sea level is 150. Um, the 5,000 feet is five times five, would be 25. So it would be 20, uh, 150 minus 25, that is five times five, or 125. If you're 10,000 feet, 5 times 10 is 50, uh, 150 minus 50 is 100, so your PiO2 would be about 100. So this works pretty well until a uh, altitude of about 15,000 feet, and then it really tends to fall off after that. But this rule of fives is helpful if you have a patient who's going to go someplace. Um, for example, in California, if I know that a patient is going to go to Mammoth to go skiing, Mammoth has an altitude of about 8,000 feet, so the PiO2 is going to be about 110. That is, 8 times 5 is 40, 150 minus 40 is 110. This just shows in greater detail. So it's really virtually identical to 10,000 feet, and it's still pretty close at 15,000 feet. So you can use this way to estimate. Now, the other thing is that barometric pressure is not the same uh, throughout the year, and it's not the same at different attitude, uh, latitudes. It turns out that it's slightly higher near the equator and tends to decrease near the poles, perhaps a little bit higher in the summer than in the winter uh, as well. This shows seasonal uh, variations in the summer at, again, the summer of Mount Everest. Uh, barometric pressure is about 10 to R, higher than um, it is in the winter. So if you want to climb Mount Everest, think about doing it in the summer, you get a little bit of a boost with more uh, atmospheric pressure. This again shows um, estimated barometric pressure 
um, at 8,000 meters or at the summit of Mount Everest. And you can see that um, uh, depending on your latitude, it's best near the equator. It's going to fall off as you get near the poles, but it remains a bit higher in summer um, compared to uh, fall or winter. And note that Mount McKinley is about here. So that uh, if you want to climb Mount McKinley, unfortunately, um, because it's nearer the poles, you have to deal with a slightly less barometric pressure than you would climbing the same altitude near Mount Everest. The partial pressure of inspired oxygen is 0.2094 or 0.21% of barometric pressure minus water vapor pressure, which is 47 torr at 37 degrees, which is body temperature. So actual barometric pressure, sea level 760, Mount Everest 253, Water vapor pressure at 37 degrees, 47. The proportion, water vapor pressure, proportion of barometric pressure is about 60% at sea level, but almost 19% at the top of Mount Everest. So the PiO2 um, with wet air, which of course is what we breathe, is about 149 at sea level, 43 in the top of Mount Everest. If this were dry, which of course is not the case inside our lungs, the PiO2 would be 159 at sea level and 53 at the top of Mount Everest. So temperature at high altitude. High altitude, um, so if we start, for example, at room temperature at sea level, if we go to 2,000 meters, the temperature is down now to 11 degrees Celsius or 52 Fahrenheit. 4,000 meters, so here we're at uh, about 13, 14,000 feet. You can see that uh, it's minus, so this is below freezing. 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and at 6,000 meters, which is uh, near 20,000 feet elevation, it's about minus 15 Celsius or five degrees Fahrenheit. So at high altitude, air is less dense. There's less ability to absorb heat. There's a lower temperature and lower humidity. Sea level, obviously, air is denser, more ability to absorb heat, higher temperature and higher humidity. So temperature falls 6.5 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit for every thousand feet in uh, elevation. On the summit of Mount Everest, wind chill is typically minus 30 to minus 50 degrees Celsius. So the time to frostbite of exposed skin is always less than 20 minutes and is typically around five minutes. So cold, certainly at extreme altitude, is another hazard. Humidity to water vapor pressure is proportional to temperature, so cold air contains little water. Dehydration occurs, especially with increased ventilation. And it's estimated that uh, one loses about 2.9 grams of water per 100 liters of ventilation. So climbers are advised to drink six to seven liters per day of fluid, even though they don't feel thirst. And even high altitude dwellers show chronic dehydration. Ozone is increased at high altitudes, potentially reaching air pollution levels. Solar radiation is increased two to three times above 4,000 meters. So the thin air, there's greater reflection, so-called albedo, and less water absorbing radiation. Ionizing radiation is increased at altitude and at 3,000 meters, um, which is a bit over 10,000 feet, um, exposure um, is increased by about 70 millirads per year. Normal background radiation is about 40 to 100 millirads per year. So basically, you double your radiation exposure at 10,000 feet. The most important hazard is hypoxia. Remember, FiO2 is always 21%, but barometric pressure falls with elevation. So the partial pressure of inspired oxygen is 21% of a decreasing barometric pressure. Additional hazards are cold temperature, Remember, temperature falls 6.5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, uh, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet. There's low humidity, and there's increased ozone, solar radiation, and uh, ionizing radiation. So let's talk about pulmonary acclimatization to high altitude, specifically to hypoxia. So of course, this would be the best way um, students in this case are carrying their beloved professor uh, to a high altitude 
research station. And if you can get this to happen, this is probably the best way to acclimatize to uh, um, ascending in altitude. So an abrupt exposure to high altitude. So now what this means is you're now at sea level and then abruptly exposed to um, the uh, equivalent PO2 of, uh, of altitude here. And here we are at about Mount Everest here. So at sea level, obviously not much change, but as you ascend, night vision is impaired initially, breathlessness, feeling of unreality, dizziness, and tingling. And this line represents the time uh, to loss of consciousness. So at the summit of Mount Everest, if you just abruptly take off your oxygen mask or, or abruptly move from sea level to this, you are conscious for less than two minutes. All right. And you can see that even 6,000 is about 21, about 20,000 feet um, in elevation. Your time to loss of consciousness is about 10 minutes. So abrupt exposure to hypoxia is a very different phenomenon and obviously has um, profound effects. And when we talk about altitude, we talk about acclimatization versus adaptation. So acclimatization is the process where lowland humans and animals adapt to the reduced partial pressure of inspired oxygen. It really refers only to changes that are viewed as beneficial, and it tends to reduce the fall of PO2 in tissues. Adaptation, on the other hand, uh, basically includes characteristics of people born and raised at an altitude. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, in the fourth section on, uh, uh, <coughs> on high altitude. But just to say, it's not clear if this is in, in genetic or due to the influence of hypoxia and growth. The answer is it's probably due to both, but we'll talk about that later. So let's talk about acclimatization first. So this just shows a time course. Now this is a log scale mode from 0.1 minutes, which is seconds, to one day, to a month, to now several years. What you can see, I'm sorry, this is months too. So what you can see is that instantaneously your heart rate increases as you go to altitude. Within 10 minutes, you have hyperventilation. Okay. Your CO2 ventilatory response uh, increases after about a day. Hemoglobin again about a day, and capillary density, um, in this case now we're up to about three months at high altitude. For those civilizations that have lived at high altitude for years, okay, 30 to 300 years, um, one tends to decrease hypoventilation, we'll talk about that, and decrease the hypoxic ventilatory response, and over millennia, uh, populations decrease their pulmonary hypoxic pressure response, pressure response, excuse me which, as you'll see, is important. These are data um, at rest for individuals who um, are at sea level, uh, acutely go to an altitude of 4,100 meters. So um, here we're talking about maybe 15,000 feet. But they're for two weeks, eight weeks, and then um, high altitude natives are over here. So what you can see is that PCO2 falls, as we've talked about, PO2 actually increases with time because of this fall in PCO2. Hemoglobin increases, and the AAO2 gradient actually increases initially as well, presumably due primarily to the diffusion um, problem with oxygen transport. These are data at maximum exercise. Same group, lowlanders, sea level, acutely go to, to an altitude of 4,100 meters, two weeks, eight weeks, and then these are high altitude natives. So with time, PCO2 decreases, hyperventilation, consequently PO2 increases, and the AO2 gradient here remains higher. So this is at maximal exercise um, at high altitude. Let's look at partial pressure of oxygen in individuals at rest in the uh, triangles and at maximal exercise. So here's sea level, and here is somebody at 5,800 feet, so that's 1,500 meters, excuse me, uh, perhaps around 20,000 feet in that range. So obviously there's a drop from ambient air to uh, moist inspired to the alveolus, arterial, and to mixed venous values. 
So the first part of this decrease is a decrease from barometric pressure to moist P-inspired um, O2 due to water vapor, right? So um, obviously at this elevation, there is going to be very dry. So adding water vapor is going to decrease the PO2 um, that you have, um, both at rest and at exercise. This next drop is from uh, moist PiO2 to P alveolar PO2, and this is due to, PC, to PCO2. So lower alveolar PCO2 increases PaO2. So you can see that the gradient here um, from PiO2 to alveolar is considerably less here because of the hyperventilation at altitude. This decrease from alveolar PO2 to arterial um, PO2 here is not due to diffusion limitation of gas exchange because remember, um, at sea level, oxygen transport is determined as perfusion limit. There is no uh, barrier essentially across the alveolar capillary membrane. But at high altitude, there is. So remember, at high altitude, um, oxygen transport is more diffusion limited. It acts like the alveolar capillary membrane has a barrier, and so there's a greater drop here. And then finally, this is a decrease from our chill PO2 to mixed venous PO2 due to diffusion limitation of gas exchange in tissues. We don't usually think about that. In tissues and um, of the metabolic rate. So again, an altitude um, a bit less than uh, at uh, sea level. So P out our chill O2 increases with time, even though P inspired O2 remains constant. The hypoxic ventilatory response increases uh, and increases a minute of ventilation, causing a decreased PCO2. Decreased PCO2, remember, causes increased oxygen. Increased oxygen contributes to increased exercise performance with increasing time and altitude. And hemoglobin uh, or hematocrit initially increases due to decreased plasma volume, but red cell mass increases later. So again, what we have here is inspired O2 here, and then we have fully acclimatized individuals and acute exposure. And you can see that alveolar PO2 um, at different altitudes here, so up to 6,000 meters here, is slightly higher in the acclimatized individuals than in the acutely exposed. And again, this is due to basically increase of the hypoxic ventilatory response, more hyperventilation, and therefore um, a higher PO2. So, oxygen transport at sea level. So, alveolar minus arterial O2 gradient is low in normal individuals at rest and exercise. So, diffusion is perfusion limited, so oxygen transport is nearly complete at the alveolus. Thus, alveolar O2 nearly equals end capillary O2. And most of the alveolar minus arterial O2 gradient is due to VQ mismatch. And obviously, in normals, that's not great. However, at high altitude, Alveolar minus arterial O2 gradient is higher in normal individuals at rest and exercise. This is because oxygen transport is diffusion limited, so O2 transport is incomplete in the alveolus. Thus, alveolar O2 exceeds end capillary O2. VQ mismatch contributes less, and most of the AO2 gradient is due to diffusion limitation of oxygen transport. So if we think about oxygen transport or diffusion, we have O2 in an effusion, uh, O2 in an alveolus, excuse me. It has to cross the wall of the alveolar capillary membrane. It has to cross plasma, and it has to get into the red cell. So the diffusing capacity, that is the ability of oxygen to completely diffuse, uh, the reciprocal of that is equal to the reciprocal of the membrane diffusing capacity, which required to, uh, to get through the alveolar capillary membrane. Uh, plus the reciprocal of theta, which is a um, constant of the chemical reaction of oxygen to hemoglobin, and the amount of hemoglobin in the lung at the time the test is done. So what does the diffusing capacity measure? So again, we have this equation. This is the diffusing capacity, membrane capacity, the hemoglobin, uh, in this case CO, but oxygen uh, reaction rate, and then hemoglobin in the lung when the test was performed. So, the diffusing capacity increases only about 10% in subjects at rest after months at 4,500 meters 
um, elevation. So this is going to be uh, roughly 15,000 feet. Now, this small increase is due to an increased rate of CO reaction with hemoglobin due to hypoxia. There's also an increased amount of hemoglobin, and there's a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which increases the saturation even at a given um, PO2. This just shows a couple of individuals who were at rest, who were at 15,000 feet and 19,000 feet. And what's plotted is their single breath diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide in this case. And you can see that as a group, it tends to increase with increasing altitude here. Now this is another one, again, showing the single breath diffusion capacity of the lung. And you can see in uh, individuals, in this case, lowlanders, uh, who are at essentially sea level 250 meters or 3,100 meters uh, elevation. At lower levels of, of O2 consumption, it's a bit greater, uh, probably not so much here. Highlanders, that is, native uh, uh, residents, um, their diffusion capacity is much greater, as we'll talk about later. So what about pulmonary functionality? So there is pulmonary edema. There's a left shift of the pressure volume curve, like emphysema. We'll talk about that. There's an increase in total lung capacity and in the residual volume to TLC ratio. There's a decreased vital capacity and an increased closing volume. So this shows the maximum expiratory flow volume curve of an individual at sea level and at altitude. So the effect of air density on altitude is about 52% of sea level. So it's going to increase your peak flow because air flow is less dense. Uh, it's going to increase the FEF50, that is the flow at halfway through this curve. Um, pulmonary resistance decreases. FEV1 is actually not significantly affected. So this was a study done by Tony Mansell. Um, and you can see uh, both controls at sea level, well, controls uh, at sea level and uh, individuals at about almost 6,000 feet, maybe 19,000, uh, 6,000 meters, excuse me, about 19,000 feet. So you can see TLC does significantly increase. While capacity is not different, FRC significantly increases and residual volume significantly increases. Therefore, RVTLC also significantly increases, even though both total lung capacity and RV increase. Pressure volume curve is kind of interesting. So the hatched areas are the normal, and you can see that there is decreased elastic recoil, decreased elastic recoil at 60% of total lung capacity. Uh, the remainder of the curve is within the normal range and not really different from the normals. So at altitude, total lung capacity increased, but residual volume increased even more. RVTLC increased more. Static lung compliance remained constant, but static lung recoil at total lung capacity did not change, but it did at 60% total lung capacity, and it was below the lower limit of normal. Both hypoxia and decreased barometric pressure at altitude may affect pulmonary mechanics. Decreased gas density at altitude increases turbulent expiratory flow, which is in the large airways. Uh, the TLC increase at altitude does increase, but the mechanism is unclear. Increased FRC would actually improve gas exchange, so there wouldn't be as much oscillation uh, in oxygen or CO2 between inspiration and exhalation. Uh, this may be due to increased intercostal muscle tone. Interstitial pulmonary edema hypothesized um, may increase the RV, and subtle pulmonary interstitial edema has been postulated at altitude to perhaps explain these. So oxygen transport altitude, remember that oxygen transport is diffusion limited. The PN capillary O2 is less than the alveolar O2, especially during exercise. Hemoglobin increases with acclimatization, increasing the, the diffusing capacity by about 10 to 15 percent. Increased ventilation decreases PCO2, which increases O2. And this important influence on oxygen transport increases with the climatization. What have we learned about high altitude uh, physiology to date? At the summit of Mount Everest, man acclimatizes to extreme altitude by increasing ventilation over five times. Hyperventilation decreases PCO2, which increases O2. Hypocapnia, alkalosis, and cold temperature increase hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. And Oxygen gas transport is diffusion limited.
Altitude poses several hazards, but the most important is hypoxia. FiO2, fraction inspired oxygen, is always 21%, but barometric pressure falls with elevation, so PO2 is 21% of a decreasing barometric pressure. Additional hazards of high altitude are cold temperature. Temperature falls 6.5 degrees Celsius per thousand meter increase in elevation, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit for every thousand feet. There's lower humidity, there's increased ozone, solar radiation, and ionizing radiation. Climatization is the beneficial changes made in response to being at high altitude. So oxygen transport, remember, is diffusion limited. So P uh, in capillary O2 is less than P alveolar O2, especially during exercise. Hemoglobin increases with the climatization, increasing the diffusing capacity by about 10 to 15 percent. There's increased ventilation, which decreases alveolar PCO2 which in turn increases alveolar O2. And this important influence on oxygen transport increases with acclimatization. So here again, we have acclimatization we've been discussing. So heart rate, hyperventilation, all occur within days, okay? Hemoglobin increases within days, capillary density takes a bit longer, months. Um, and then adaptation, which is in populations anywhere from Three to 30,000 years, which we'll talk about later. So next time, we'll continue our study of high altitude physiology, the second session. Thanks again to our producer director, Dr. Catalan the winter. And thank you for joining me for the great adventure of pediatric pulmonary physiology.